Welcome to the Missionary on the Mountain podcast, where we discuss all the pertinent social, religious, and political topics of the day. Join us weekly for scripture, news, interviews, and insight into the issues that matter to you. Broadcasting from 8,000 feet deep within the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, consistently conservative and unapologetically Christian, here is your host, the Missionary on the Mountain, Kenny Easton. Hello, my friends, and welcome to the first episode of Missionary on the Mountain podcast. I am the Missionary on the Mountain, Kenny Easton. Thank you for joining us today. So, I think it's important that we first establish why we are here, which means I need to explain to you who I am, what I'm doing, and where I'm doing it. So, I am Kenny Easton, like I said, and I am a missionary that lives on a mountain. I work at Mountaintop Retreat in Colorado and I run multiple camps and I host church groups and family reunions and Girl Scouts and all that kind of good stuff and my concentration is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with as many people as I can that come through this camp. So what is this podcast? Why start Missionary on the Mountain podcast? Well, to put it simply, I feel like our society is degrading. We're beginning to fall apart. The, the things that bound us together as a nation for the past couple hundred plus years no longer exist in the forms that they used to exist. Um, what I mean by that is the family values, um, having a stable family life with two parents at home, um, having multiple children, um, things like that, that used to hold up our society, um, that provided a good tax base and that also provided um, good moral uh, compasses for the people that come out of these family situations. So I think that uh, we need to pay attention to these things. And then also, uh, there's an assault on our freedom of speech. And um, I know there's a lot of attention being paid to that right now on campuses, but I figured that I would also jump in because um, our society is degrading. Our society is becoming godless, and I think that we need to bring our society back to God if we expect to prosper in the future. So that is why I started this particular podcast. So where can you find this podcast? Well, you can find it wherever you are currently listening to it, because obviously you're listening to it. And then also uh, YouTube, if you'd like to have some visuals um, along with it, there is also a video product on YouTube. So we hope that you will join us over there at Missionary on the Mountain there on YouTube. So the format of this podcast, there are going to be multiple segments. Um, There will be a scripture of the week every week. There will be words of wisdom every week. And I will update you on the mission uh, that I am doing out here at camp each week, but then there will also be things that don't happen every week. Scriptural situations will be a fun segment where we go back in time and put ourselves in a situation where we have to make decisions that people in Bible times had to make. And then um, there will also be things more infrequently, such as interviews and uh, debates, civil debates about important social, religious, political issues that are facing particularly Christians, but uh, society at large as well. I'm going to try to have interviews with various experts, which uh, we already have a few booked. Um, Some are Christian, some are secular, and they're from a variety of fields. So all of this being said, my, my goal is that each week in every episode of this podcast, you will be, of course, entertained, or why would you listen to a podcast, but also that you would learn something new and that you would be encouraged in your faith, in your walk with Christ. So... Thank you for joining us for this first inaugural episode of Missionary on the Mountain podcast. Let's get right into our first mission update. Mission update. So in the mission update segment, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's going on up here at camp. So Mountaintop Retreat, like I told you in the last segment, is the camp up here in the Rocky Mountains, and we serve all sorts of clientele. Um, 
I work with one other missionary up here on the mountain, and we are the only two employees, and we are full-time employees. Uh, we don't get paid by the camp because obviously we are missionaries, and we are missionaries through In Faith. If you would like to go look us up, you could also find the link to that in the description of this podcast. So, other things that are going on at camp. Um, our camp start in June, so we're currently recruiting helpers and staff. Um, pray for us for a nurse for the first week of June, because that's where our biggest need is right now. Uh, we have to be in compliance with state law, and that means having a nurse, so we need a nurse. The other two weeks are booked for our particular camps, um, and the rental camps have different rules. So, I'm currently working on the curriculum. Um, I'm working with the passage from Matthew about taking Christ's yoke upon you because his uh, burden is light. So that's kind of where we're going with it. And in this day and age, kids are faced with a lot of problems. Um, social media makes life extremely difficult. The fact that everything is second to second uh, as far as communication goes um, makes it very difficult to be a teenager especially. So we are working on um, on that curriculum at the time being, and I think it's going to work out real well. So June through September at camp is booked nearly solid this year. Um, obviously, I told you that our June camps are uh, are camps that we run the programming of, but then in July, August, September, and October, we are booked with various other groups. Um, Everything for our summer camps uh, to rental groups to family reunions to we have two weddings this year, which is very cool. Um, and then we have a couple groups groups of hunters coming in uh, during the early fall months to do some bow hunting. So that's going to be a lot of fun. And these guys were in here last year and we, we had a good time ministering with them. Oh, what else is new? Well, we just installed in our chapel a new four channel wireless setup. Um, it's going to be great compared to what we had before. Uh, we just built this chapel last year and finished the inside, um, just under a year ago. Uh, we heat it at wood up here at camp. We are off grid, so we heat it with wood. Um, and we built the stove for that chapel, but I will, uh, address that on another day, perhaps on another episode. Um, so the four channel wireless setup that will help all of our uh, groups that use the camp. We have some groups that have two and three hundred people in worship at the same time in the chapel. Um, and obviously groups that big tend to have five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten person bands. Um, so that makes the cords kind of cumbersome if you don't have a decent wireless setup. So we did invest in a wireless setup and now are ready for this next year. What else? Um, my wife, Jennifer, who will be on for today's interview and to tell us a little bit about what she is reading currently, we just got back from Indiana, which is where we are originally from, and uh, we were visiting family, and I got to speak at a couple of churches out there, and uh, we got to spend some good time with my in-laws and some friends, so that was a lot of fun. We did drive, which is a about 22-hour each-way trip. Um, we brought two of our three dogs with us. Uh, the third is 14 years old. He's a black lab and that's kind of a cumbersome trip for him. So we did not take Rocky the black lab with us, but we did take our yellow lab Mattis and our yellow lab mixed with the great Pyrenees Ivan with us. And we just had a great time and we're blessed by that and blessed to see all of our friends and family and uh, people from the church that we both kind of grew up in. So when we got home, we uh, got back to camp and we decided it was time to get our chicks for the year. Jen and I raised chickens. Um, this year we are getting meat birds and laying birds. And so we have 50 chickens. We have six buff Orpingtons, six barred rocks, and then the rest are Cornish roasters. Last year we did Cornish roasters and it worked out great. We had 25 Cornish roasters um, and it went really well. So we decided to do it again this year. But this year we decided we wanted some layers as well. So we got some Buff Orpingtons and some Barred Rocks and we're hoping to start a little flock. So that's some exciting things. Um, let's see, what else is new at camp? 
Well, we need new dorms. That's that's our biggest thing. We have four dorm buildings, which are glorified tents, really. Um, but they are falling apart. They've been up for too long and taken way too much weather, and it is time to replace them. So we've designed new buildings, which come at a price tag of $100,000 a piece, and we have to build two of them to replace the current capacity of our dorms. These dorms, however, will improve a lot of things about our camp and open up... Um, couples camps and couples retreats and wedding party type things uh, for the future. So uh, if that's something that you feel moved to donate to, to help improve things up here at Mountain Top Retreat, you can check the uh, new dorms video in the description below. I think that that's about all we've got. So let's get into the news. Extra, extra news from the pews. It seems like there's never a slow news day in this day and age, uh, especially during the Trump presidency. Things have gotten a little intense with the news coming quickly. So we're just going to cover, cover a couple of the main news things from this past couple weeks. First, obviously, is the Bob Mueller report. Um... The president had been saying for years that there had been no Russian collusion, um, and that is exactly what the Mueller report found, according to the Attorney General Bill Barr. Um, we have not seen the full report yet, as of today, when I am recording this, but we expect to see that by mid-April. So when that comes out in mid-April, I will give it a read. I hear that it's between three and 400 pages, but uh, I'm always game for a, for a fun, invigorating read of political speech. So I will give that a look and we will chat about it when it comes out. But so far we know no collusion, no obstruction of justice, according to Mueller and the attorney general. So was the investigation started by corrupt deep, deep state actors. Now that's kind of the questions. Was it behind the scenes at the Obama DOJ, FBI, CIA? Was it for political reasons? Is that why this whole report was started? Um, obviously we know that uh, the Christopher Seale dossier was full of salacious and unverified materials. Um, and why the media and the Democratic Party and a lot of the people in the center, honestly, b bought this hook, line, and sinker, I'm not entirely sure. But um, regardless, the president has been mostly exonerated, and we will see what is in the rest of the Mueller report, and we will reserve judgment until then. The next big thing that's been in the news is Jesse Smollett. Now, <clears throat> I'm, like I said, initially from Northwest Indiana. I lived right near Chicago, 30 minutes from downtown. I know exactly what Chicago's like. I have been there many, 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 many times. I am a Chicago White Sox fan, a Bears fan, and a Bulls fan, and a Blackhawks fan. And I've been there many times for food and entertainment and music. So, I can tell you firsthand... Chicago is not MAGA country. I have a MAGA hat. I have worn it in Chicago. You don't get much support. Believe me. Very, very little support for Donald Trump in Chicago. So, from the very get-go, this smelled like a hoax to me. And so, I didn't even... I just dismissed it out of hand. So... How it turns out is that he accused two MAGA hat wearing white men of attacking him, pouring bleach on him in downtown Chicago at 2 a.m. during a polar vortex. Now, he was coming out of Subway because he was hungry and he was walking the street and going back to his um, hotel or apartment or whatever. And these two men come out yelling slurs, racial slurs, and homophobic slurs. And they attack him and they wrap a cord around his neck like a noose. And they pour bleach on him and they yell at him and then they leave. Well, this just stinks of a hoax. And it was a hoax. So it turns out that these two men were not white. And they were friends or personal trainers of Jesse Smollett. And he paid them $3,500, I think, which he signed a check for, leaving a paper trail, to jump him 
while wearing these red caps, and there's video evidence of these two men at the convenience store buying the cord and the red hats, as well as ski masks. So, the way it turns out is that Jesse organized all of this, and he was brought up by the Chicago Police Department on 16 charges, felony charges. Now, the shocking part, you may ask. To me, the shocking part is that these 16 felonies were dropped by Kim Fox. Now, Kim Fox is the district attorney in that part of Chicago, and she has a history of letting people off lightly, especially people with political or social means or agendas. So, the 16 felony charges were dropped in a surprise emergency hearing, um, citing 16 hours of community service and for forfeiture of his $10,000 bond to the city of Chicago. Now, this community service was served at Jesse Jackson's fraudulent organization before the court even ruled. That sounds like an inside job. The district attorney also has been investigated for political favors in the past, and I personally expect her to fall under scrutiny again due to this particular abortion of justice. Um, the dismissal charges, um, or the dismissal of charges rather, was not an exoneration, and the prosec prosecutor that dropped the charges uh, made a point to say that Smollett, in his opinion, was guilty, and that they could have gotten a conviction, but they made a deal. Now, things get sticky from here. The court records are sealed, so we don't know what the deal was. We don't know if he was guilty or if he wasn't guilty. We don't get to see the evidence. Um, now, Smollett, he, he still faces potential federal charges because he also, <laughs> to make matters worse, sent himself a fake death threat letter. And he even put white powder in this letter. And since it didn't get enough attention, he staged this following hoax. Um, the most sickening part to me is that we, we know, all know he's guilty, the evidence is overwhelming, and he still has the audacity to look in the camera and look us all in the eye and claim that he has been 100% truthful from the beginning and that he, quote, wouldn't be my mother's son if I was capable of any of the things I'm being accused of, end quote. This guy's a piece of trash. He it has nothing to do with skin color, it has nothing to do with sexual preference. What it has to do with is that he's an embarrassment to our country because he helped further a perception that, number one, there's no equal justice under the law. There is different justice for people who are rich or powerful or connected. And number two, that Chicago, he's pr furthering this perception that Chicago is a city rife with corruption at the highest level of their political hierarchy, which very well may be true, but they didn't need this furtherance of that idea. So if you're rich and well-connected, if you're like a Smollett, or a Comey, or a Clinton, or a Clapper, or a Brennan, you can commit things like fake hate crimes, or lie, or cheat, or obfuscate, or obstruct justice, while the little guy, the average citizen, or, heaven forbid, a conservative or a Christian, would have the book thrown at him and likely spend serious time in prison. This whole Jesse Smollett thing is not over, and we will keep you updated on it. But for now, let's have some applicable words of wisdom. Words of Wisdom Today's wise words come from Jose N. Harris. This one goes out to you, Jussie Smollett. There is beauty in truth, even if it's painful. Those who lie twist life so that it looks tasty to the lazy, brilliant to the ignorant, and powerful to the weak. But lies only strengthen our defects. They don't teach anything, help anything, fix anything, or cure anything. Nor do they develop one's character, one's mind, one's heart, or one's soul. Scripture of the Week Today's scripture is Proverbs 31, 10 to 31, and it is in honor of today's guest, 
my beautiful wife, Jennifer. The wife of noble character. A wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships, bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it is still night. She provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings she plants a vineyard. She sets out about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand, she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate, where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them, and supplies the merchants with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom, and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household, and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all that her hands have done, and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. Welcome to the Easton Library. Today we are joined by my beautiful and intelligent and just so pleasant to be with every day wife, Jennifer Easton. Jennifer, welcome to the mountain. Hi. <laughs> Funny story. My wife does not like to be on camera or on audio recording or anything like that. So this is kind of one of her greatest fears. So she is just a little nervous. Just slightly nervous, but that's okay, because we're going to be talking about one of the things she loves the most besides me, and that is books. My wife is an avid reader, and right now she's on pace to read how many books this year, dear? Uh, 52. So a book a week. Yes, that's the goal. Wow, 52 books, which would mean that you're up to how many books so far this year? I believe I'm on my 14th for this 14th year. 14th book. So today we're going to be talking a little bit about the books that we're reading this year and um, the books we've already read. So I read as well, and I love to read, but I tend to read a lot of studies and um, things like that, intellectual things out of universities, um, whereas Jen loves to read novels. She will pick up a thousand-page book and just skim right through it. It's pretty amazing, which is why she's able to read 52 books in a year. Um, Jen, why don't you tell us just a little bit about what do you do? Where do you work? Why do you love to read so much? Um, well, I am an eighth grade reading teacher at the local middle school here in Montrose. Um, and I have always loved to read. I don't really have a particular reason other than I remember my dad always reading as a kid. So that was something that kind of followed through with me. What kind of books does your dad read primarily? Um, he reads a lot of history books or historical fiction, which is one of my favorite genres as well. What era is your favorite, would you say? Uh, World War II era. Why? Um, I don't have a particular reason. I just like to follow through with all of their stories and learn the history behind it. Um, history is another one of my enjoyment things that I like. Uh, so I like the mixture of history and fiction. Hmm. Do you have a favorite book out of that era? Uh, my favorite book would have to be Night by Elie Wiesel. Why is that your favorite? It was one of the first books I read uh, about the Holocaust era, and I just found it very moving and touching. Excellent. I have not read that book, but uh, Jen has long since told me that I have to. So uh, we're going to go through some of the books that we've read so far this year, 
and then we'll tell you what our favorites were. So um, do you want to go one at a time, Jen, or do you want me to go first? And um, do you want to go first? Open to whatever. All right. Sounds good. So uh, the, the first book that I read this year, um, well, I'm, I'm always reading the Bible, so that's bit by bit by bit. And then, of course, Jen and I both uh, attend church on Sundays, and we work through scripture there as well. So we won't spend a whole lot of time on that. But in addition to that, I have a morning and evening book, and morning and evening is the title of the book, and it's a Charles Spurgeon devotional book, um, and that was a gift from one of my close friends and neighbors, and I have been reading that, um, well, for the whole year, and so that's the first thing that I've been working on, and it does have a devotion for both mornings and evenings. Um, Spurgeon, if you had, haven't read him, it's a little dense. Uh, so I have had to recycle a lot of those devotions and read them a couple times. Um, Jen, what have you been reading? Well, this year I kind of challenged myself to go a little outside my comfort zone and read a lot of different genres. Um, so I started out the year with Where the Crawdads Sing by Delia Owens. I'd heard a lot of good things from a lot of different people. Um, and it's kind of a biologist mixed with a fiction kind of point of view, but a very interesting read. Um, that I would recommend to anybody. Hmm. What was it about? It was about a young girl who was abandoned by her family at the age of five, um, and she lived on the ocean. I want to say it was in North Carolina, um, but she kind of learned to survive by herself, and she ended up getting a PhD in biology without having any formal schooling up until the age of like 19 or so. Um, so just a really interesting story. Wow, fascinating. And that was the first book you read this year? What was the second? Um, the second was actually a memoir called Educated by Tara Westover, uh, another book that I had heard a lot of great things about. Um, and it was kind of an interesting perspective of a girl who grew up in Idaho um, with kind of a survivalist father who was also a very staunch Mormon believer. Um, and the book kind of told of the things that she had to deal with as a child and how she second guessed those things as an adult. Hmm. And if I recall you reading that book, it was a very impactful book um, about what education can mean in your life. Yeah, she was another one who her parents didn't believe in education. So they took her out of school um, and she ended up going to Yale and Oxford and getting her PhD a couple times over. Wow. So, so as we work through these, uh, I notice you're sitting with a little yellow book on your lap. And uh, I'll, I'll just give this little tidbit of information. As my, my wife take note, takes notes on every book that she reads. Um, why do you find that valuable? Um, well, it's actually a thing that I kind of adopted because I usually ask my students to take some sort of note on what they're reading. Hmm. Um, so I usually write memorable quotes or just themes or motifs in general that I found interesting about a book. Do you also, find yourself reflecting a lot as you write in that book, like on and working your way through the details of the, the meanings behind the books that you've just read? I do, especially if I really like a book and want to either recommend it to somebody or read again to try to understand a little bit of different aspects of the book, like the one that I recommended to you that you have on your table there. Well, what a great segue. Thank you. So then book that I have sitting in front of me under my morning and evening uh, book is a book by, how would you pronounce that? Amor Towels? Amor Towels. Amor Towels. Um, this is A Gentleman in Moscow. And uh, I haven't read his other book either, but I think that Jen has read both of the, these books. A Gentleman in Moscow, I am only like maybe an eighth of the way through it, but it is a story about a bourgeoisie man who was exiled, basically, to the very top attic of a famous hotel in Moscow during the rule of the USSR. That uh, I'm enjoying it a lot. I think it's a fantastic book thus far, and uh, Mr. Towles is, a, is an excellent writer. So, um, yeah, but I'm that's one of my current reads, which uh, I'm very much enjoying, and on the recommendation of my wife, what'd you read after that last one, my dear? Um, I read The Poisoner's Handbook. Um, the author's last name is Bloom. I can't remember her first name. Uh, but it was a nonfiction book recommended to me by one of my scientific friends. Um, not a book that I would have picked up normally, but I really enjoyed it. It was kind of about the rise of medical examiners in New York during the Jazz Age. Um, so it talked about the history of all the poisons um, and how those things came to life and how modern medical examiners uh, kind of got their protocol. Would you say there's a lot of benefit of um, 
reading things outside of your comfortable genre. I think so. And that's why I challenged myself to do that this year, just because it's easy to get into kind of a rhythm of what you enjoy, but you learn a little bit more from reading other things. Hmm. I'm a little bit of a victim of that, uh, as my wife knows. I have a lot of religion books, um, as you might guess, given that I'm a missionary, or given that I am a missionary. And then also, I read a lot of Stephen King, actually. I'm, uh, I enjoy his writing style, and I enjoy a lot of the sci-fi and uh, suspense that he puts out. So, what's next on your list? Um, I read a, another nonfiction book, uh, probably one of the best books I've read in a really long time, called The Library Book by Susan Orlean. And she um, studies the history of the Los Angeles City fire of the library there. Um, and she kind of just goes into depth talking about that and talking about how libraries impact people and how libraries are ever changing. Um, just a very interesting read, kind of a comment on society as well as libraries. Also funny that the suggestion for that book came from our pastor, and not just from our pastor, but our pastor from the pulpit, telling us uh, what he's read so far this year. So uh, shout out to our pastor. What's next on our list there? Um, the, I'm currently reading, I've read a couple more throughout the past, but I'm currently reading The Great Alone by Kristen Hanna. Um, she wrote another book that I really enjoyed called The Nightingale about World War II era stuff. Um, and this one takes place right after the Vietnam War. Hmm. Excellent. And then what's next? I would keep reading the books that I have read, but uh, you've read a lot more books than I have this year. And we're kind of sticking to that. So I'll, I'll get to my two or three other that I've read later in your list. So we'll keep working through yours. So after the Kristen Hanna book. Um, I read Eleanor Oliphant is Completely Fine. Uh, which is kind of another different genre for me. It was It's a place in modern-day Scotland, um, and it was about a young woman who had a social disorder. And so just the she, you know, recorded all the thoughts that went through her head and how she spoke with other people and interacted with other people. And it was just kind of touching, but also a little realistic. Excellent. Feel free to continue. You've got way more books than I do again. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, another book I read on a suggestion of a student was Hubner vs. Hitler. One of your eighth grade students? One of my eighth grade students. And um, if I recall, this book was a paperweight of a book. Yes, it was about a thousand pages. Um, wow. And he came to me and asked me if I'd like to read it. And of course, it's in my time, my genre that I enjoy. So I agreed to read it. And uh, about two hours later, he came to me and asked me if I'd already finished it. Um, <laughs> the same day huh? <laughs> the same day and continued asking me pretty much mm. every every day after that if i'd read it so i had to rush through it over the weekend so how long did it take you to read that thousand page oh, book gosh, i don't know maybe seven at most days six yeah at most it was less than a week that i had borrowed it wow. from him so if it uh it gives you any idea of the veracity of my wife's reading habit uh that explains it so I'll give you one of my books now. So the first book that I read this year in its entirety, if you don't include devotions and scripture, etc., was Elevation by Stephen King. Um, Stephen King tends to write very, very long books and be very descriptive, which I enjoy, typically. Uh, Elevation is very short and has very little description and actually only covers uh, maybe a year's worth of time, a uh, year and a half worth of time. Um... It was my least, uh, maybe I hesitate to say least favorite Stephen King book, of which I've read probably about 50 to 55, um, maybe more than that even. Uh, but, but it was definitely in my bottom few, um, mostly because I'm used to his description and his long-windedness in that. Um, and then there were also just a couple... Uh, I don't know, a couple of small choices that I thought were silly. I thought that he framed a few characters in, in, in kind of strange ways that weren't realistic um, and almost painted caricatures of a few of his characters, which is not typical of Stephen King. So, uh, But Elevation by Stephen King was the first one that I read in its entirety. Jen? Uh, another book I read earlier in the year was Reese Witherspoon's Whiskey in a Teacup. Um, I adore Reese Witherspoon. I think she's a... Where, where did oh. you get that book? You bought it for me for Christmas. Thanks. 
Um, she's just a wonderful person, I think, to watch and enjoy. Uh, but she kind of wrote this book about how being a lady was a little going out of style and how she was always going to kind of stick to her southern roots. And it was just kind of filled with comical little quips and good advice in general. Well, and I like Reese Witherspoon in other contexts as well. Um, wasn't she in Wild? Yes. Based on another book that you really enjoyed. Yes. Not not that was read this year, but... Yes. Um, and what was that one about? Um, Cheryl Strayed, who <clears throat> uh, had went through some severe kind of emotional distress in her own life, so she decided to hike the Pacific Crest Trail. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which was a very cool story. If you mm-hmm. haven't read that or seen the movie, both, I think, are probably worth, mm-hmm. worth the experience. Absolutely. But. What's next on your list? Um, I actually read the other book you were talking about by Amor Tolls. Uh, Rules of Civility was his first novel that he wrote. And I didn't enjoy it as much as I did A Gentleman in Moscow. Is that from the same era, genre? It was know? from kind of Raging 20s New York. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay. And just kind of about the socialites of New York and how they went about their days. and. Just out of curiosity, was the writing as good? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I just and didn't he's enjoy an the excellent story writer. Line. He yes. is. Okay. Um, the next book I think we both listened to on audiobook. Oh, that's right. Hillbilly Elegy. Hillbilly Elegy, which I very much enjoyed, but go ahead and give us your synopsis. Um, it was written by J.D. Vance, and he kind of explored the, what would you call it, uh, the middle class of Midwest? Yeah, I suppose I would call it the, uh, I don't even know, I guess the working poor mm-hmm. of the Appalachia slash Midwest down mm-hmm. from from Georgia all the way up through Ohio. Well, you talked about the uh, migration of, you know, the old coal miners mm-hmm. and how they would go to the Midwest to start these new lives. Mm-hmm. And basically, you know, things didn't really change much for them. Um, but how the kids were able to some of the kids were able to kind of make something from nothing. Mm-hmm. Another story where education was super powerful. Well, another upbringing. one who went to Yale, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yale Law School, if I recall. Yes. Yeah, and a v- very cool story and, and kind of a story about how everybody's upbringing is different and how where you come from and who you know and what your family looks like can really impact um, can really impact what do you end up as. But also, you can overachieve your beginnings, which uh, kind of the American dream, I suppose. And that was one of the things that the, the writer of Hibiliology really focused on was that he was the example of the American mm-hmm. dream. Yeah. What's next? Um, another book I read was The Immortalist by Chloe Benjamin. Um, and it's about these four siblings who learn from a psychic when their exact death date would be. Mm. Um, and then the book follows their four stories for short snippets of their life. Um, and I didn't necessarily enjoy the characters or what they did with their lives, but it made me really think about how you would live your life if you knew exactly when you were going to die. Yeah, that's kind of a what if question. Because, mm-hmm. you, you know, knew? one of the boys obviously just went off and partied and did exactly what he wanted without any consequences, but he died really young. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the woman who died when she was older, she lived a very calculated life and accomplished educational goals as well, well as research goals. What do you think's the point? I think the point is to make you think, like, what would you do in that situation? Maybe a little play on fate. So if you knew you were going to die old versus knew you were going to die young, that would affect how you lived out your life. Mm -hmm. Because if you knew you were going to die, you know, in five years, would you work as hard? Probably not. Yeah, at least not in the for long term goals, for sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. All right. Well, uh, let's see. I've given you three of my four. So uh, my last one is another Stephen King book and is the one that I'm currently working on. It is The Dead Zone. I have only read one chapter or so in this book, so I can't tell you much about it. But this is an older book. I think it was actually written the year that I was born. Um, I could be wrong about that, but I think that that's true. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to it, but I'm not sure exactly what it's about yet. So, and I haven't seen the movie. I know there is a movie, but I have intentionally not seen the movie. So I am going to reserve judgment about The Dead Zone until our next segment um, of the Easton's Library. So, Jen, where are we at? How many books we got left? Um, Well, I haven't gone through them all. I've just kind of gone through the highlights, but I'll talk about maybe one more here. Yeah, give us Um, one or two more, and then we'll talk about what our favorite book so far this year is. Okay. Well, the last book I finished was Becoming by Michelle Obama. 
Um, and I was kind of influenced to read this because I read Ivanka Trump's book last year and it was phenomenal about kind of being a woman who works or a woman who is able to kind of do all the things, take care of the kids and work and still be a person. Um, so I read Michelle's book as well. I didn't enjoy it that much. I kind of felt it was a little too pointedly political for my beliefs. Um, but it was interesting and it was kind of cool to get little snippets of her and Barack's life kind of outside of the public eye. Um, and just some of her stories were kind of cute to look at. Well, and I think that this brings up a good point that it's good to experience, um, views outside of your own, um, counter views things that you may not necessarily agree with, and and to look at life through different lenses that you don't look through. Uh, And and not just saying that if you're a conservative, read liberals, and if you're a liberal, read conservative. That's not what I'm talking about. Um, What Jen was just saying is that she read both Ivanka Trump's and Michelle Obama's books. Uh, It's good to see both sides of things. It's good to understand where a billionaire... Um, daughter of the president is coming from, as well as a first lady who came from a completely different background in Chicago. Um, these are things that are just good good to expose yourself to. And I would say good to expose yourself to in, in all different realms, not just in what you read, but in the politics that you take in and the music that you listen to and, and various things. It's good to have diversity in your life. Um, yeah, I agree. Uh, and the one thing I really loved about Ivanka Trump's book is that she kind of made the point to make routines in her life so that she could feel like a total normal person, even though she has this, you know, multi-million dollar business. Um, but another really cool thing about her was that she didn't want to use her father's wealth and, um, I guess celebrity for getting herself ahead in business. Uh, she refused a job from her father and actually started off on her own at a different company before she started working for her father, just to kind of get her feet wet in her own sense, which I thought was really kind of an admirable thing to do. Wow. Yeah, yeah, that's excellent. I mean, a lot of people, uh, especially that come from a billionaire or multimillionaire family, would just be satisfied to ride coattails. Mm-hmm. And we see a lot of that with, you know, Hollywood type people. So, yeah. You got one more for us, dear? Um, well, I thought we were just going to talk about our last favorite oh, book here. We're on to the favorite. We're on to the favorite. Okay. Of the books you've read so far this year, what is your favorite book? The Library Book by Susan Orlean. Why? It was just a topic. I I mean, I've loved libraries all my life, obviously, um, but I never really knew much about the Los Angeles fire. Um, and I just love the way she weaved real history into the investigation behind the fire, into like how libraries are evolving and changing. It was really interesting. And you were telling me other things about that, how it also went through like a a history of libraries. Yes. Which is kind of fascinating. A a book called The Library Book that walks you through the history of libraries. Yeah, but there were just so many different different stories going on that it was just amazing and you should definitely read it. Um, But like they started libraries by women delivering books to people on horseback. That was like the first library system. Um, And then eventually they got to a library building. uh, But, you know, women couldn't get library cards. So libraries were mobile. They were to begin with. Wow. And then women couldn't get. Women couldn't get library cards. Um, Kids couldn't get library cards until they were, I think, like 17 or 18. It was like a gentleman's club kind of thing. Um, And then they started getting different librarians. And there was this one woman librarian who kind of changed the system. Um, And they're just constantly evolving um, to nowadays where libraries are faced with kind of dealing with the homelessness issue. Yeah, tell us more about that. You would talk to me about that when you were reading it. Um, Well, I've noticed in our local library, our public library, that there's always kind of homeless people hanging around. Uh, And I guess that's an issue with libraries all around the nation. Um, And it's because libraries provide a lot of free services um, and now they're kind of welcoming that population. So bathrooms and... Bathrooms and tax help and okay, yeah. small community meetings and clubs and things like that. Um, and a place to be in that's air conditioned and heated. Or heated, yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, mm. So that's kind of one of their um, main things that they're taking on is trying to help out that population of people, which I think is just interesting. And you never thought about a library having to take on all these public and social norms i guess sure sure well and they're open all the time and Mm -hmm. 
a reliable place for, like you said, heat and warmth mm-hmm. and utilities of some sort. And they were talking about the current Los Angeles librarian. Um, he's actually working on like bringing in food programs and all these other kinds of helpful programs for them. Well, and as we know, in Los Angeles, large population of homeless people and mm-hmm. um, and we, we're from near Chicago, as we stated earlier in the podcast. So we have seen plenty of uh, that kind of thing and, and how those things can escalate. So it's good to have programs that can help um you know, fill the gap for those people that don't have warmth and don't have water. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it has been a pleasure having you down in your own basement, my dear. Well, thank you. You're very welcome. I'm sorry this was probably so horribly uncomfortable for you, but this has been the Missionary on the Mountain podcast. Please tune, tune in next week. Share, like, and subscribe. You can find us on YouTube or Facebook, and you can go and find us on all the various places that you watch podcasts. Um, thanks for listening. God bless you, and have a safe trip down the mountain. The Missionary on the Mountain podcast is not affiliated with or supported by In Faith or any other mission or organization. We are not funded by nor beholden to anyone but our listeners. All words and opinions expressed on the show are solely those of the individuals expressing them. Find us on YouTube, social media, and your favorite podcast listening platform. Join us next week, and thanks for tuning in to the Missionary on the Mountain podcast.